The makers of Schick now also own the Harry's Shaving Products brand. This week, we ask just exactly what does it take for disruptive brands to shake up the status quo in a market category. Plus, we'll be joined by special guest Paul Paradis from Sezzle. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Marketing is Broken, the weekly series where we think being disruptive is pretty much always a good thing. All I'm saying, they're gonna get a Shh. I Shh. I'm just, we, sh we sh knock, knock. Who's there? Sh Another modern consumer brand has officially made it big. That's right, Edgewell Personal Care Company recently announced their decision to buy Harry's for $1.37 billion. That's even more than the $1 billion that Unilever paid to acquire Dollar Shave Club back in 2016, which is impressive considering that Harry's is only about six years old. In a press release published on May 19th, Edgewell declared that Harry's has been a disruptive force across the men's and women's shaving market. Edgewell president Rod Little said, the combination of Edgewell and Harry's is a pivotal step forward in further transforming our organization and strengthening our competitive position and ability to drive sustained growth and value creation. In other words, Edgewell was probably losing a lot of market share to Harry's, so they decided to buy them. You know what they say, if you can't beat them, acquire them? We wanted to know what it takes to disrupt a category in need of a shakeup, and so we reached out to Paul Paradis, the chief revenue officer and co-founder of alternative payments platform Sezzle, to ask him some questions about how it's done. You've raised over $100 million to disrupt the consumer credit industry. What's broken about credit today, and why is Sezzle's approach a threat to the way that things have been done? Yeah, we think that there's two really major issues with traditional credit. And um, the first one stemmed from the recession um, around lack of access to credit. So post-recession, you had banks tightening their credit standards, which is to be expected in a downturn. But you also had some pretty significant changes in legislation that most people don't know about. Um, the legal age of getting a credit card moved from 18 to 21. Uh, it also prohibited marketing credit cards on college campuses and uh, prohibited giving away free stuff for applying for a credit card. And I think those were very well-intentioned um, laws. But as a result, you have about a 23% lower adoption rate from Generation X to Millennials um, at the same wow. stage in life. Yeah. And... Um, you know, for some people, that's good. I think there's probably a lot of people that uh, got into debt, got into credit trouble, probably some people that were saved from that by this, these new laws. But there are also a lot of people out there that could responsibly own a credit card and need them to build their credit scores because that's really important in the U.S., right? Sure. If you want to buy a home, buy a car, you know, anytime you want to take out a loan, you need to have good credit. And so um, that was one thing that we believe was broken with credit was lack of access to it. And so, you know, we've built alternative underwriting models to be able to approve more people. Um, our approval rate on a purchase is upwards of 80, 90%, as opposed to a traditional credit card's approval rate, of uh, maybe 20, 30%. Um, but the other thing is, I think credit cards are very ambiguous when it comes to fee structure, interest rates, and really they've been built to be complicated purely to make more money off of consumers, right? Sure. And so there's a lot of people, even if they have access to credit cards that maybe don't want to use them because they distrust credit card issuers. So they don't understand how it works and they don't want to get into a debt spiral, right? So we wanted to create a solution that was more simple, more consumer friendly, allowed you to budget a purchase over time in interest-free installments, um, automatically debit your debit card every two weeks. So you're not, you don't even have to think about paying off this open line of credit. It's a closed loop credit. Um, and it really seems to be resonating with consumers. You know, in the 3,500 um, or so merchants that we're working with today, uh, we're processing, you know, close to 15% of their order volume. So it, it's wow. becoming a, a pretty major payment method. And we That's believe great. it'll only continue to grow. 
Sure. So two uh, major macro trends there that you mentioned for disruption. Um, on that note, in the book Zero to One, Peter Thiel mentions this 10x rule that says a successful business should strive to be 10x better than its next competitor. Is that true or false or somewhere in between in your experience? I, I think it's somewhere in between. I, I do think the intention of the statement is good in that if you really want to do something significant and create significant value, you should strive to be 10x better than your next competitor. I think that's um, kind of, you know, it, it fits with the tenets of capitalism, you know, just, just trying to be the best. Um, but I don't think it, it necessarily holds that you have to be 10x better than your closest competitor to have a successful business. Um, maybe if you're wanting to build a world changing monopoly like an Amazon or a Facebook, you need to be 10x better than your, your closest competitor. But I think, you know, Uber is a great example. They recently IPO'd they have a $62 billion market cap, I think, now after going down the last few days. Are they 10x better than Lyft? No, they're not. Um, and Lyft has built a successful company. They, they just went public as well. Are they 10x better than traditional taxi services? I would say yes. Like the, the, the move from taxi, calling a taxi to moving to Uber or Lyft, like 10x better. Um, but then your next closest competitor, I don't know. So I, I think... It really, I think the heart of the statement is good. I think you should always strive to make major incremental changes, especially if you're wanting to build a, a, a great company, you know, but there's a lot of people out there that I think have successful businesses that um, don't necessarily need to be 10x better than the next uh, best competitor. And I would still classify them as successful. That makes a lot of sense. All right, last question. What should marketers do if they want to find the biggest opportunities for disruption in their specific marketing category? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of the book Traction by Gabriel Weinberg and Justin Morris. And, and they basically ad, advocate for you know, brainstorming a bunch of different strategies and ideas across every different customer acquisition channel and marketing channel. I think there's 19 of them or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then identifying three that you think could have the biggest impact for your business and running small traction tests on those three. And then when you find a channel or an idea that really returns value, hammer it, you know, hammer, it, hammer, it, hammer it until competitors figure it out and the channel dries up and then go run more tests and figure out what that next channel. I, so I think marketers from, from my um, experience, experience, marketers have a hard time crossing the strategy to implementation gap. They love brainstorming all these great ideas and strategies, but then they spend a ton of time, you know, making sure it's perfect. And then they roll it out and it might be three, six months later. And, you know, it may not work. It's like, you know, th that, that one idea may not have worked. Right. Whereas I think if, if marketers took more of an MVP approach, like startup general startups do and, you know, think up three ideas, small ideas, get the infrastructure in place to test whether they're working or not, create solid goals for yourself so that you know if they're working or not, and then adjust uh, quickly, you know, let the test run, let them run for enough time that you have a good sense, but don't put all your eggs in one basket on one idea and blow it up and it has to be perfect, right? I think a great example, you, you mentioned Harry's, um, I think Dollar Shave Club is a great example of a company that did this very well. You know, they have that viral video that everybody knows about. Sure. That video cost about five grand and it took them a day to shoot, right? So that's a perfect example of a traction test that went really, really well, right? And then not every traction test is going to go that well. They got acquired but, for a billion dollars. I'd say right. it worked out pretty well. That's right. So I think, you know, um, if you want to disrupt as a marketer, I think you need to get better at nimbly identifying strategies, but then executing quickly and testing and seeing if they work or not. And if they don't, uh, move on to the next test. If, if, if something does work, then hammer it, then make it perfect, right? Uh, but there, there just needs to be more execution and more tests um, than I think most marketers are implementing today. Paul Paradis, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. What's your favorite disruptive brand in? Why did they have such an impact on you? How do you identify the biggest areas for disruption and what should incumbent brands do if they don't wanna get complacent? Share your thoughts in the comments below and you might just win yourself some new Brandish Insights gear.
We'll see you next time. Hey, it's Josh from Brandish Insights. Thank you for watching Marketing is Broken. If you like this week's episode, please click below to subscribe or check out other episodes. And if your company could use more insights around your branding efforts, check out brandishinsights.com.